Hello and welcome. I'm John Feinblatt, president of Everytown for Gun Safety. And I'm Shannon Watts, founder of Moms Demand Action, the grassroots arm of Everytown. Today, we're hosting Ambassador Susan Rice for the seventh installment of Demanding Women. Ambassador Rice, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, John and Shannon. It's great to be with you and all of our audience. I really want to just begin by thanking you and Every Town for Gun Safety and Moms Demand Action for your extraordinary leadership in making the critical issues of gun violence and gun safety front and center. You all are amazing advocates. All of your organizations, your volunteers are doing extraordinary work, and I'm really proud to have the chance to be with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, I can tell you we so appreciate it. Now, as you know, we've been talking with women leaders about urgent issues like racial justice, police violence, and COVID-19, all through the lens of gun violence. And we are couldn't be luckier to have you with us today. As former ambassador of the United Nations and national security advisor, you are an expert on the threats facing our country. And gun violence, which kills more than 100 people a day, is clearly one of those threats. And now the murders of Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery reinforce that we must confront two more facts about racism and gun violence. First, just like COVID, Black Americans are bearing the heaviest burden. And second, and when, when police discharge their weapons, it's gun violence. And we have to name it and we have to address it. Of course, the Trump administration has chosen to ignore these facts. As you pointed out recently in the New York Times, Trump responded to peaceful protests in D.C. by sending in troops. Because that's what he does. He looks to divide. I know you believe that political divisions are our greatest threat, and I'm eager to hear your thoughts about how we start bridging that divide. So Shannon, why don't you take it from here? I'm gonna hop on Twitter and watch the rest there. Thanks, John. And Ambassador, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so grateful. I know our volunteers are really looking forward to hearing from you today. Thank you, Shannon, appreciate so it. Let's, let, Let's dive right in. Um, I, Susan, I want to start with what's top of mind for so many of us, and that is the nation's reckoning with the killings of Black people and the systemic racism that it represents. There are so many things that we could discuss, but let's start with how should we be thinking about racism, white supremacy, and policing policies? Well, Shannon, I think the first thing everybody needs to recognize and appreciate is what you said in your question. This is a systemic problem. Racism in our country remains a systemic problem. Uh, even so many years after the end of slavery and the enactment of the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, the election of an African-American president, we still have fundamental issues of racism that pervade every aspect of our society. Uh, we've seen it very starkly in police killings and police brutality and the pattern and practices of, of too many uh, police uh, entities around the country. Um, the reality is, Shannon, that speaking as an African-American woman, as painful as it is, there are too many ways that every day people who look like me and my children and my nieces and nephews are not viewed as equal in this country. Uh, and we face barriers and threats that other people don't face. Um, and so we have to begin by recognizing the systemic nature of it. This is something, qu quite frankly, that is remarkably to me still a subject of debate. If you listen to officials in the Trump administration, they're constantly denying that we have a systemic problem. It's always a few bad apples. Well, it's systemic. Mm -hmm. It's systemic in our policing and our criminal justice system. And we need systemic solutions, including the, uh, the Justice and Policing Act, uh, which has now been introduced uh, in both houses of Congress by Democrats, uh, but many more steps that reimagine the nature uh, of policing and dealing with criminal justice in a way that truly recognizes the humanity 
of African Americans and all Americans. But beyond policing and criminal justice, this is a problem that pervades every aspect of society. The inequality is rooted in everything from housing to education to the environment uh, to health care. These disparities persist and they too require systemic solutions, solutions that finally and fully address these disparities for African Americans and other people of color in this country so that we can fulfill our national promise of being a truly equal society. You know, Susan, you just mentioned that uh, the Trump administration really refuses to see this as a systemic issue. And when Americans were gathering to protest peacefully in the streets and this administration's response was to bring out the military, So what is your reaction to the Trump administration's militaristic response? It's absolutely inappropriate. It's infuriating. It's counterproductive. Mm. Uh, And in my judgment, frankly, Shannon, it was designed to inflame. The president Mm. wanted to tout his so-called law and order credentials. And he was out there behaving like George Wallace, not like a responsible president of the United States. And he invoked, you know, segregationist rhetoric. You know, uh, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. He talked about calling out dogs. These are not dog whistles to racists. These are bullhorn calls for uh, racially charged violence in this country. So when he brought out federal forces onto the streets of the District of Columbia and used violence against peaceful protesters, it was outrageous. We had Humvees on the streets. We had Black Hawk helicopters flying at very low altitudes, buzzing and terrorizing peaceful protesters. We had unmarked militia uh, on our streets from God knows what federal agency, accountable to nobody and in no clear chain of command. We had, you know, military in the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We had checkpoints on our streets so that, you know, People could not drive through without, you know, presenting themselves to these militarized forces, federal forces, and explaining where they were going and why they were going. It was ridiculous and it was outrageous. Mm. And as you can tell, it still makes me extremely angry. Uh, And then to have those federal forces use horses and batons and shields and tear gas and rubber bullets against peaceful protesters and journalists and then try to deny it when, you know, cameras were rolling, just tells you how, um, how vicious these people are. This is not how Mm. responsible leadership responds to peaceful protesters exercising their first amendment rights. Uh, yes, in, in Washington and elsewhere, there were some incidents of violence and, and looting, uh, that rightfully should be condemned. But that was a very small uh, and limited portion of what t- actually transpired. The vast majority of these people were peaceful. They were multiracial, multigenerational. They were kids in strollers. And they were out there, you know, coming together around a critical issue. Um, so the, the, the administration's response was absolutely irresponsible. And as I said, I believe it was designed to inflame And I'm very proud of the people of the District of Columbia that they didn't take the bait. They didn't rise to that provocation and give, you know, the president images of of racially charged battles in our city streets. I think, you know, this idea of it being designed to inflame is is so key and so important. And, you know, you've argued that our domestic political divisions are the greatest threat to our nation's national security. And really, it's an understatement to say that the president is making those divisions worse. So how should a president respond to what's happening right now? We know how a president should respond. We had a prior president who responded with humility and empathy and uh, caring and unifying messages. We have in Vice President Joe Biden, the Democratic nominee, to be you know, somebody who modeled precisely the kind of leadership that we need in, in the speech he gave a couple of weeks ago and how he acts every day. A president of the United States should proceed from the premise that we are all Americans, that we all matter equally, 
that we're all in the same boat and we sink or swim together, whether on the international stage as we have to compete and confront you know, foreign adversaries, uh, or whether domestically as we're trying to grow our economy and become more resilient and you know, combat a pandemic uh, and so many other things that we only can face if we come together. To have a president who instead goes out of his way virtually every day to divide and inflame our divisions is just, you know, it's reprehensible, it's dangerous, and frankly, it threatens our cohesion as a nation and our survival as a democracy, which is one of the many, many reasons, Shannon, why I think this is the most important election of my lifetime and why we absolutely positively have to get Donald Trump out of the White House and replace him with somebody as Joe Biden is, who understands that we are stronger when we come together and that we can't meet the challenges that we face domestically or internationally without that national unity. And can I just say one other thing? The reason why I argue in many different places that our domestic political divisions are our greatest national security vulnerability is really for two things, two reasons. One, our divisions prevent us from getting basic things done that we all need to be a stronger, more prosperous nation, whether it's investing in infrastructure or ensuring that you know, we have universal child care uh, or whether it's coming together to confront a pandemic. We are not able to do that and, and take the, the critical steps that should be easy uh, as, as Americans all under the same roof because of those divisions, but also our adversaries, particularly Russia, but also China, understand that our divisions are uh, things that they can effectively exacerbate. And the Russians do it every day on social media, not just every two years or four years when we have an election. They post inflammatory messages. They light up their bots on both sides of every hot issue, whether it's race or guns or gay rights or immigration, and they try to pit us against each other. And because we have this vulnerability, which are our divisions, they are able to exploit them and weaken us from within. Uh, and that's their objective, to discredit democracy and to debilitate us as a uh, potential foreign adversary. And we're playing into their hands. So true. And, and you know, you've, you've mentioned the pandemic a couple of times. You know, you grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, you've seen the city change dramatically. And it's now one of the hardest hit cities in the country when it comes to gun violence. So it's battling gun violence and the coronavirus crisis. What can we do to support communities in D.C. that are, that are battling both of these crises at the same time? Well, I'm, I'm a proud born and raised Washingtonian uh, and D.C. native, and I have seen the city evolve and change over time. Shannon, I think the most important thing for people to understand is this is a very different city. It's a safer, more prosperous, uh, more equitable city, despite its still uh, you know, great disparities of, of wealth uh, along racial lines than it was in the past. Uh, you know, D.C. used to be known as the murder capital of the world. We've moved past that. Uh, and, and that's to uh, the, uh, the credit of the people and, and our leadership. But we have been hard hit by the coronavirus. Uh, and because of our demographics, because of the, you know, the health inequities and, and health challenges that disproportionately affect African-Americans and Latinos in this city, uh, we have really uh, been knocked on the back of our heels by coronavirus, but we are battling forward and, and, and trying to get uh, to bend that curve with some success. Same on the issue of, of gun violence. Um, we still face in this city, um, years after the worst of it, uh, a real challenge with gun violence. And like in so many other cities, you know, these two things have converged uh, with gun violence sustained during the course of a pandemic or, or even increased. And so what we really need uh, is the kind of programs at the community level that reduce violence, that put community leaders in close contact uh, with those most likely to commit violence, that is supportive of those who've been traumatized by violence, that 
you know, indicates that at the, at the grassroots level, we have zero tolerance for random and, and deliberate gun violence um, and, and to make that a priority. And I think in many communities in our city, we have leadership that's committed to that, but we need to step it up and we need the, the social services and the economic support and all of the incentives to come together uh, to reduce the, the probability of and the impact of gun violence. Yeah, those programs are incredibly important. I, I want to turn now just to another aspect of your national security background. You know, we've seen this rise of armed insurrectionists with often white supremacist ideology, um, open carrying guns in public, and in recent mass shootings like the ones at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh or at a Walmart in El Paso. They were committed by hate-filled individuals and really could be classified as domestic terrorism. So what can and should the federal government do to combat this threat? Well, Shannon, the most important thing is to see it for what it is, it is what you just said. It's domestic terrorism. Uh, and instead of shining a spotlight on the reality that far more Americans have been killed by domestic terrorists with white supremacist leanings than by foreign terrorists in recent years on our soil, uh, that should be a wake-up call to um, our, our federal institutions, our, our Justice Department, our Department of Homeland Security, to prioritize domestic terrorism, white nationalist terrorism, uh, as uh, the threat that it is. And instead, the Trump administration is suppressing and refusing to release the data that backs up that reality, that shows how serious it is. Um, and, and while in parts of our government, there's certainly a, a growing recognition, for example, in the FBI, that this is a real problem, uh, it is not gaining the support and the attention that it needs from the top. So when President Trump talks about the extremists uh, who in the early days of the of the protests, uh, you know, hijacked some of those protests and, and employed violence. He talks only about Antifa, uh, which now we know through a lot of other sources has been way overblown, hasn't been a big player, but says nothing, nor does Attorney General Bill Barr, about the white nationalists who have been arrested in places like Nevada and Colorado for actually being at these rallies with weapons designed to uh, to try to start something. So, uh, you know, we need to be to face this problem square on. We need to acknowledge it. Uh, to acknowledge it is is the start and then to put in place the programs and efforts to attack it as we would foreign terrorist threats, which obviously we also need to be very vigilant about. But we can't, you know, create this misimpression that we don't actually face a very deadly internal insidious threat that uh, has clear-cut white nationalist uh, leanings. Susan, I want to zoom out a little bit. You know, you mentioned your family earlier and the impact of, of systemic racism and inequalities. As a Black woman, as a mom, as someone with nearly 25 years of public experience, what has shaped how you approach the nation's gun violence epidemic? Well, Shannon, I, you know, just as a citizen, as an American living in this country and seeing time after time after time, you know, horrific, senseless acts of gun violence, you know, from Colorado uh, to, you know, Virginia Tech to, you know, Marjorie Stoneman, Douglas, Sandy Hook, every, I mean, any everywhere you turn is happening and it doesn't stop. You know, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when this was a less pervasive challenge and now it's become almost an everyday thing. As a mother with kids in school, like any other parent, I just fear that, you know, their school could become the next target. As an African-American mom and a woman uh, you know, I can't escape the reality that gun violence is the number one killer of black children in this country. Uh, and as a policy leader, you know, it, it's, it's unthinkable to me that even though vast majorities of Americans 
favor common sense gun restrictions, universal background checks, you know, bans on assault weapons. We have a very powerful lobby that has effectively prevented so much of that from being enacted. It's absolutely outrageous. Um, and it, it makes me as angry as anything. Um, and I just, that, that's just part of being a human being and a, and a mother uh, and a citizen in this country. We cannot continue to live with this. It's absolutely senseless. And it's, if it were anything else, there would be a unified hue and cry and, uh, and sustained action to attack it. But the NRA being what it is, has bought too many members uh, of our Congress and has prevented this from happening. But I think that's can and will change. I believe the popular sentiment is there. The extraordinary work that you and Moms Demand Action and Every Town for Gun Safety and other groups are doing to raise attention to this and to vote out those who are doing the NRA's bidding and to vote in those who would make change. That's absolutely essential. You're right. It's key and it, and it's working. You know, we're getting there. Um, I, I would like to, if it's OK now, pivot to a video question uh, for Re Reverend Sharon Risher. Uh, she's a Moms Demand Action volunteer and a member of the Every Town Survivor Network. And she has a question for you. Thank you. Hello, Ambassador. June Hello. 17th will make five years since my mother, Mrs. Ethel Lant, my two cousins and a childhood friend were shot and killed in Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. A young man with hate filled in his heart slaughtered them. I understand that your father was born and raised in South Carolina. Over the years, I've turned my focus to healing and advocating for stronger gun laws. So my question to you is, what do you view as the role of a survivor's voice like myself in creating a safer and just nation? Reverend Sharon, if I can call you that, I'm so sorry for your losses. I cannot imagine one such loss, much less four. Uh, and my heart is with you and your community, your family, particularly as we come up on the fifth anniversary of the massacre at Mother Emanuel. Um, I think it's extraordinary that from your pain, you have found the critical mission and purpose of advocating as a survivor for an end to gun violence, for the kinds of laws and policies that would have made what happened five years ago impossible, and what happened at the Pulse nightclub four years ago impossible. So your leadership, your personal passion, the pain that you bring to this issue is so powerful and so motivating to all of us. It's the voice of somebody like you and those who have survived the worst of this that can bring this issue to the front and center as a matter of human concern, just like the parents from Sandy Hook and the young men and women from Parkland. It's so valuable. Thank you, thank you for being so brave and being so committed and for challenging all of us to finally get this right. Thank you, Susan and Sharon is so brave. Thank you for your question, Sharon. Susan, I'd like to pivot to uh, the 2020 elections. What do you think Joe Biden's approach should be to our nation's gun violence epidemic? Should he be talking about this in tra on the trail and, and if so, how? Absolutely, he should be. And he is talking about it and will continue to. I think for the folks on, on this uh, call, they know Joe Biden's record. He's been a leader against gun violence for so many years. You know, he was a critical uh, sponsor of the Brady Bill, of the original assault weapons ban, 
of the Violence Against Women Act. And he has a very, very detailed, clear-cut, aggressive, comprehensive platform to go against all aspects of gun violence. He's taken on the NRA twice and won. Uh, When he served with President Obama in the Obama-Biden administration, we implemented more than two dozen very important reforms that, that put curbs on uh, access to guns, but we need legislation. So we need leadership in Joe Biden that understands and is passionate about these issues, who has a comprehensive record and will take this forward with the universal background checks, with the enactment of, of a new Violence Against Women Act. Uh, with you know a permanent and and comprehensive assault weapons ban and ban on high capacity magazines that will work to buy back those assault weapons that are out there and ensure that those that remain are fully uh, registered. There's a whole detailed long uh, plan of action that you can find on Joe Biden's website that goes through in great detail all of the steps that that he will take that are so vital to be taken. And so that is why we need, um, among many other reasons, Joe Biden in the White House and Democrats in control of the House and the Senate, because that's what it's going to take to to make this legislation real and to make it lasting. We agree. And we, we know that when candidates talk about this issue, the issue of gun safety, they win. Um, I'd like to close with one more thing. Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action volunteers have been fighting tirelessly for gun safety and winning. Do you have a message for them? Yes, Shannon, to you and, and John and all of your volunteers. First of all, God bless you. You are doing <laughs> the most critical work, uh, work that will save more American lives than almost anything I can think of. When you consider that we've lost more Americans in gun violence than we've lost in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Vietnam combined, 40,000 deaths a year to gun violence in this country, it's just unbelievable. And the only way it's going to change is through the kind of effective grassroots action that you all are leading and taking. Because as we said earlier, the reality is the American people want common sense gun laws. They understand that, that where we are in the United States is absolutely unacceptable. It sets us vastly apart from any other uh, democratic country in the, in, on the planet. And so your hard work, your activism every day, making sure that this issue is front and center and making sure that the people who care about it are engaged in our process and are registered and are out voting uh, for those candidates that are committed to change and committed to strong, comprehensive, common sense gun laws. That is vitally important work. And I'm extraordinarily grateful for all that you're doing. Um, It's been my honor to be able to be in conversation with you all. And I hope that you will take this series of conversations that you all have sponsored and be, I hope, just a little bit more motivated and inspired to to continue doing the critical work that you're doing and know that there's so many Americans like me who are extremely grateful for your hard work and your enduring commitment. Well, I, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we are motivated and inspired by you and so grateful for your support. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Your voice in this fight is so important and we're so glad you're in our corner. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thanks for all you do. Have a good day, Ambassador. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us on Twitter and Facebook. Stay tuned for more. Follow at Everytown and at Moms Demand for information on the next Demanding Women conversation. If you'd like to join us in this fight, Get involved with Every Town, Moms Demand Action, and Students Demand Action. Just text the word READY to 64433. And as always, stay safe. Remember, nothing is more productive, persuasive, or powerful than demanding women.